Good morning, good morning. Hey, man, praise the Lord. That was awesome. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, woo, the one who saved me by his grace. Man, I, woo, I've never got over what Jesus did for me. Amen. I hope you haven't either. Praise the Lord. You have a Bible this morning, open it anywhere. It's all good. Amen. Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew 10. We'll start there and get somewhere else in a little bit. But uh, praise the Lord. Pray for our pastor, Pastor Mark, Miss Cheryl. They're away this weekend. Some good needed rest. Uh, as you know, our pastor, Pastor Brown, he's a work, work mule. Works, 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 works. And uh, so we need to force him to take some time off from time to time. So I'm so glad that he has that opportunity to do that. So pray for him as he's away. Also, I hope you're continually uh, praying for our mission team that's in Mexico City today. Uh, Randy Adams is preaching down in Mexico City, and the team is going to be evangelizing all week. So please pray for that team. Pray for Josh Bennett and uh, Maddox uh, Hughes is there, and uh, uh, Courtney and Sean O'Neill and Tammy Mercer, Eddie Hodges, and uh, along, of course, with Randy, please uh, pray for them and their safety and the power of God, uh, the God would use them while they're there and uh, see uh, souls come to Jesus. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. So in Matthew chapter 10 this morning, I was thinking about, uh, you know, putting together this message uh, when I got saved. I got saved in October of 1978. And, and those of you that know my testimony, have heard my testimony, I, I didn't want to go to church that morning. <laughs> I did everything I could to get out of it, but my wife prayed and my wife begged me to come to church and we happened to come on the last day of a revival meeting and I sat in the very very back I was scared to death I didn't want to be there I was uh, not a Christian uh, but I believed there was a God you know the Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God see you're not born an atheist you're educated into believing and becoming a fool is that right all right, amen. I've got a former atheist right there who's now a blood-bought child of God, my son-in-law, who someone persistently, persistently, persistently kept giving him the Word of God, and he got under conviction of the Holy Ghost and got saved. Amen. amen. So there you go. An atheist can get saved. So you pray for those people because they don't believe in God. One day they're going to believe in God. I just hope it's on this side of the grave and not on the other side of the grave because, boy, I think once uh, an atheist dies, someone that's lost dies, they're going to wake up with a reality. You know, my dad used to say, oh, you just go into the ground, you're just worm bait, son. You're just worm bait. And uh, I kept saying, Dad, you don't know. Uh, you know, what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, I guess I'll have to suffer the consequences. I said, yeah, but you don't have to suffer the consequences because the consequences have already been paid for you. Okay? Jesus made a way for you and for me. That's why he, God became a man. A man couldn't take away your sin. It had to be God himself who would come to this earth through a virgin birth to go to a cross to die, shed his perfect blood for your sin and my sin. Woo! But you have to accept that. You have to receive that. John 1.12 says, But many that received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so again, uh, I'm so thankful for the day I got saved. I got saved. I didn't know an Old Testament from a New Testament. I just know that I came down. I cried out to God, said, God, be merciful to sinner. I began to name my sins. I think that's why I was there for an hour. I don't know. I was, I was just... I probably left them all out, but I think I probably got saved in my seat before I ever came forward. But I was at, at, at the altar, crying and weeping, begging God to save me. And when I got up off my knees, you know, I didn't go flying around the room. I, I wasn't twinkle dusted, but something did happen. You know what happened? My guilt was gone. My shame was gone. My, my, the peace of God flooded my soul. I had, a, oh, I had a rest I had never known before in my life, you know? And again, I, I, what Jesus did for me that day, I had to tell somebody. I mean, I just had to tell somebody. So all my friends were lost, and so you can imagine the reception I got, going to all my friends and 
telling them, hey, Jesus saved me, Jesus saved me, and he can save you too. You need to repent, you need to trust Christ, and I lost all my friends. It was amazing. But then God's given me a bunch of new friends, amen? The family of God. I'm so thankful for the family of God. But I remember that October 78, I got saved after my first year of pro ball. Spring training came to 79. I stick a New Testament in my, my, my pocket. I'm, at, I'm just reading my Bible, telling people about Jesus, making everybody mad, you know, and uh, thinking that I was better than them. And I told them, I said, look, I'm not better than you. Matter of fact, I'm worse than you. Look, God didn't call the righteous. He came to call the sinners. And I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. And God's mercy and goodness and grace flooded my soul. And I got to just tell you what he did for me. And he can do it for you, okay, if you'll place your faith and trust in him. And so I was reading my Bible all the time. I get to, Becky and I get to Charlotte, North Carolina. Becky can remember my phone rang one evening after the game. It was late. And it was First Baptist Church of North Carolina, of Charlotte, North Carolina. And they called and they said, uh, we would like you to come speak at a father-son breakfast at 6 o'clock Saturday morning. And I'm thinking, 6 o'clock Saturday morning, breakfast, there ain't nobody going to be up. You know, I'm a ball player. You know, we, we play till midnight and wake up maybe 9 or 10, you know, that type of thing. Nobody gets up at 6 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, goes to breakfast. So, but I was reading this passage of Scripture right before they called. And look at Matthew 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Verse 34. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. Ooh. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Man, when I got saved, I didn't realize that's what was going to take place. You know what I'm saying? The fact that I had gotten saved, I wanted to tell my family about Jesus. Man, I ran to my dad and told him, Dad, you don't, you don't trust Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're going to die and go to hell. And he looked at me and said, Who are you? I knew you as a little boy. I've seen how rotten you are. You needed Jesus. He said, I, I'm, I'm a good guy. You know, I'm all right. Nothing, nothing wrong with me. All of a sudden, man, there was some foes in my family. He says in verse 37, he says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy worthy of me and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me powerful powerful verses right there and i'm i don't think that we understand the significance of what jesus christ is telling his disciples and his people you know he said look you don't it's not the fact that you hate your father and your mother and you, he said you got to love me first you got to love me first you got to put me first in your life follow me let's pray father lord as we come in the name of jesus god would you bless your word speak to our hearts lord in a crowd this size lord you know it's amazing how omniscient you are you're all knowing you know where each of us are at this morning all about us you know our uprising you know our down sitting and god we come before you a needy people god forgive me cleanse my heart lord just cleanse us open our eyes to your word today spirit of god speak to us spirit of god convict us reprove us correct us instruct us whatever it takes god draw us a little closer to thee i pray in jesus name amen this is Missions Sunday. I've been asked by our pastor to, uh, uh, to preach uh, uh, today. It's been on the books for a little while. We are a mission-minded church. We have a team in Mexico City right now. We had a team that went to Oaxaca 
Mexico pretty soon. We've got a couple of us going back to Zambia, Africa. We have missions every almost day of the week up here. Somebody, when you go out and you pass out a track or you tell someone about Jesus Christ, you're on mission. All right, whether you're here or whether you're out on the sports park, we have a sports park out there. We just finished Mighty Mites. And man, we had some kids on my team that they didn't know who Jesus was. But at the end of the season, they knew who Jesus was. And they believed who Jesus was and is. And so I'm so thankful of that. The opportunities that our pastor, again, his vision for the church, using the fields, using our culture, using sports as a means of sharing the gospel with young kids and their parents. We're having uh, flag football come up, brother, pretty soon, ready to go. Amen. Excited about that. Well, the coaches out there and the players, and, and uh, we've got a, a golf tournament coming up in two weeks. It's not about the golf. It's not about out there, man. I, I lose more golf balls than anybody. You know, I tell my, my kids, they always ask me, Dad, what do you want for Father's Day? Golf balls. What do you want for your birthday? Golf balls. Why do you want golf balls? Because I can't see very far, so when I hit them, I can't find them, okay, unless somebody finds it for me. So, I mean, I just drop one and go on. Amen, Dwayne? So, uh, but uh, anyway, golf balls, okay? But anyway, we're going to have a tournament, and all proceeds are going what? To build beds for kids that don't have beds, and the opportunity for our church to come together and do that, and then have the opportunity to deliver them and share Christ with those families. And so opportunities are avail us here at First Bible Baptist Church to have a heart for missions. And so today's message is entitled, The Heart of a Soul Winner. The Heart of a Soul Winner. You see, soul winning, evangelizing, witnessing, it's a heart issue. That's what it is. It's not a mind issue because we've been to school. We've been to church. We've heard the word of God. We know that Jesus said five times in less than 40 days before he ascended to the Father, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He told them that in Matthew 28 and Mark 16 and Luke and John and Acts 1-8 before he ascended and gave power, gave the church the authority to go and to spread the gospel. But what does it mean to have a heart of a soul winner. Remember, it is not just the act of soul winning that makes an effective witness. It is the condition of our hearts. That's where it's at. It's a heart condition, okay, that's going to compel us by what? By the love of Christ. By the love of Christ. Aren't you glad that Jesus saved you? Shouldn't it motivate us? Shouldn't it push us? Shouldn't it constrain us to go and tell someone else how to be saved? Maybe give out a track every once in a while. There's no hurt. Give out a track as you run. Amen? That way you don't have to talk to them. No, stop and talk to them. Amen? It's okay. You see, when a Christian has a true, pure heart before God and they witness in the power of of the Holy Ghost, great things can happen that you won't believe could happen. Last week, Sean O'Neill called me. He was so pumped. He was so pumped. Y'all know Sean and Courtney. Well, if you don't know him, Sean and Courtney are in our church. They just went on their first mission trip. They're there in Mexico City. First time they've ever gone on a foreign mission trip. They're there this week to tell people how to be saved. They're witnessing. Well, he had two men come in. He works a business here in town. He had two men come in, and, and so I don't know exactly what he does, sales or whatever, and they, so they sort of were together. They, he took them out to dinner that night and kind of whining and dining them, so to speak, you know, and, and uh, so Sean got to thinking, I'm going down to Mexico to witness, but I ought to be witnessing here. So to make a long story short, he started witnessing to these two guys at the table because they were talking about, what are you going to be doing? Well, I'm going on a mission trip. And they said, what's that? So that led in right into a conversation. To make a long story short, he led both of those men to Christ at the dinner table. Amen. See, never underestimate the power of God and God's word as you give it out. 
It's not our power. It's the power of God. It's the gospel that is the power, the dynamite of God. We are just called to deliver it. We're called to give it out. We're called to be a witness. And so when a Christian has that pure heart before God, has that heart of a soul winner, you know, you can find the word, the two words soul winning or winning souls in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. I think it's on the screen up there. It says, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And he that winneth souls is what? Is wise. Look at Proverbs 14. It says, a true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. So remember, it's not just the act of going out soul winning that makes us an effective witness. It is the condition of our hearts compelled by, again, the love of Christ that's going to make us into that true witness for the Lord. The word soul winner, I think today, is sort of uh, looked upon or ridiculed by modern churches. You know, a few years ago when I first got saved back in 78 and was going to a church, we would... uh, Go soul winning. That's what we called it. We went soul winning. We would go out on Thursday night. We would go out on Saturday morning. Sometimes we'd go on the streets and we'd pass out tracks and we'd stand in front of bus stops. We had 20 minutes. We had about 10 minute preaching on the streets and handing out tracks. Man, that was fun to see the reactions of the people as you're giving them the gospel, maybe for the first time or out in public. And sometimes they're not very happy to hear what you have to say amen but it's kind of neat i think maybe those days of soul winning was more for for me than it was really for them but the fact that god was giving me some boldness some boldness to proclaim his word so i think the term is often ridiculed by a lot of people the term does not mean that we have the power to convert anyone you know i've heard people say well you know, Bobby saved me. I didn't save anybody. You know, oh, Brett Brownie saved me. Dwayne saved me. You know, Pastor Josh, he saved me. No, we can't save anybody. It's God that does the converting. It's God that does that conversion and the and the and the and the 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 the, 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 the conviction that comes into our life, the Holy Spirit of God. So this term comes, this soul winner term comes from Proverbs eleven. In Proverbs 14, and again, it is from these verses we get that word soul winner. In the real sense, what does that mean? To be what? A witness. To tell other people about Jesus Christ. To preach to others. To tell others what the Lord has done for us. To give our testimony. To tell them how we got saved. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will what? Reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me. You see, we are his mouthpieces. We are the witnesses, okay? But God is the one that brings the conviction. God is the one, the Holy Spirit, who brings a new soul to him. The conversion takes place by the Spirit of God. You know, when I got saved, like I said, I didn't know anything other than I was a sinner. And I needed to be saved. I needed my sins to be forgiven. And when I fell on my knees and cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let me tell you something. I didn't know an Old Testament, a New Testament. I didn't know verses in Scripture. But I knew one thing. When I got up off my knees, there was a peace that I never had before. And the guilt that I had that was gnawing at me all the time of my life, that guilt was gone. I didn't fly around the room. I wasn't twinkle-dusted. But let me tell you something. I could take a, a deep breath. And there was no condemnation that was coming into my life and into my soul. 
because Jesus Christ took my sins when I came to that altar and cried out to him to save my soul and believed it. You know, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13, very powerful verse, Ephesians 1, verse 13, in whom, Jesus, ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He says, in whom? In Jesus. I trusted. I trusted the finished work. I called on Jesus Christ. It wasn't baptism that was going to save me. It wasn't church that was going to save me. It wasn't myself turning over a new leaf that was going to save me. It was Jesus that was going to save me. And it was only him. As he says in his word, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's one way. He says in John 1, but many that receive him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And boy, I believe, and I trusted him to save my soul. I believed in the gospel. What is that? Jesus Christ died for my sins. Okay. He was, according to the scriptures, he was buried and rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. When I heard that, woo, I believed. And the Holy Spirit of God came in. Colossians 2 said that we're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. The Holy Spirit came in and cut my soul away from my body, and I was born again. And if you got saved, you were born again. And the Spirit of God came in. And we are to be witnesses. We are to be his mouthpiece. Soul winners, they speak of the gospel so others can respond to the work of the Holy Spirit of God and be born again. You know, when it comes to our witness, doing the work without the Holy Ghost working in our lives. Oh, man. We put the time in, but we don't really have a heart for God. Woo. Soul winning does not begin with a stirred up meeting. Soul winning does not begin because the preacher gets up here and says we ought to all be soul winning. It begins when we, as a church, get a real heart for Jesus Christ, a real heart and passion and love for our Savior and what he's done for us. Because if we really get a hold of that, then we should not keep this shut. I got to tell somebody. I got to tell somebody what Jesus did for me. I just can't keep it quiet. Yeah, I'll listen to what you have to say. Okay, and I'll be very patient. But then when it's time for me to speak, let me tell you what God says. Let me tell you what God says about who you are and what you are and what he's done for you you. See, again, I pray, God, we would get a hold of God. Let's look at some characteristics real quickly of some soul winners. I was doing some study on some missionaries and people that just uh, have had an impact on my life, people that uh, were great soul winners, and there's two things they had in common. Number one thing was the depth of their love for Jesus. They just loved Jesus. <laughs> They loved what Jesus had done for them so much that it motivated them into doing what Jesus commanded them to do, which was what? Tell somebody. Tell somebody what Jesus Christ has done for you. And then the second thing that's characteristic is that each of these people that I was reading about, they were active with personal evangelism. You know, we... Brownie put something here at the church that's ADP Sports, and we have an opportunity to go out there. He creates that environment for us to go out there and be prayed up and to give the Word of God out and teach these young people about the Lord. And We do all this, and we have a great, uh, led by Brian Calloway, salt and light, where we go door to door and knock on the doors and evangelize in our neighborhood. And We have small groups, and I hope in a small group you're teaching and, and, and handing out tracts to other people, inviting people to small groups, because it's all about personal evangelization. 
Are we involved in telling other people about Jesus? Are we involved in sharing the gospel? You say, well, I haven't led anybody to Christ, but I've, I've watered, I've planted seeds. Keep planting the seed. God gives the increase. I can't save anybody, but I can sow it, and I can water it, and I can sow it, and I can water it, and let God give the increase. Let God move on somebody's heart and say, you know what? I've never done that before. I've never called upon the name of the Lord. I've never gotten saved. I've never gotten born again. What does it mean? If you don't know what it means, I invite you to come see me. If you're too embarrassed to come down here at the end of service, call me on the phone. I don't want you to die and go to hell. Would you grant me the opportunity or Brownie the opportunity or one of the pastoral staff to take the Bible and show you what it means to be saved, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? See, a Christian with the heart of God is going to witness for him. Your life is going to be a witness. History tells us of so many men and women that do these things. They have a love for Jesus. That love for Jesus motivates them into being a personal a personal and active evangelist. These men and women had hearts to make Jesus known. You know, when I got saved, I didn't know anything, but I knew one thing. Most of my family were lost. So guess what I did? I went home, told my whole family, set them all down, told my dad he was going to hell. Boy, that went over really big. Told my mom that, told my brothers that, told everybody I could think of that. They weren't too happy. Going back to Matthew, all of a sudden, you know, your household kind of becomes divided there because they're not seeing, you know. And then all of a sudden, they hear later on that I walk away from baseball. What? You're walking away from baseball? You're going to serve Jesus? You have lost your mind. You're crazy. You're going to Africa? What are you? You're crazy. But you know what? I witnessed them and witnessed them and witnessed them. And you know what God showed me one day? He said, you know what? If I'll take care of what God is leading me to do, if I'll take care of his business, he'll take care of my family. So little by little, my family started getting saved. Dad got saved. Mom got saved. Brother got saved. Sister got saved. I got one to go now. Woo, still working on him. Amen. I hope he realizes it's not the water that saves you, but the blood of Jesus Christ that takes away our sins. And it's not of anything we can do. It's a free gift. Here it is, but you've got to receive it. You've got to accept it by faith. You've got to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. There was a great missionary by the name of Hudson Taylor. Maybe some of you have heard about him. He says, with God, all things are possible. And no conviction ever takes place but by the almighty power of the Holy Ghost. I can't convict anybody. What I'm preaching here today, I can't convict anybody of anything I say, but if the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart, it's the Holy Spirit doing it and not me. So if you're starting to feel kind of bad, well, you know, I really don't witness very much. I don't really, you know, I don't really like maybe, what time is it? Maybe I can beat the Pentecostals to the, you know, the buffet line, amen? I, I don't know, but anyway... It's not Bobby Bonner bringing the conviction. It's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart. What are you going to do about it? Because I'm just telling you what God says. Okay? Do you know God? Hudson Taylor says, the greatest need of every Christian is to know God. To know him in such a powerful way that you want to share him with other people. My wife has been praying for some time. She wants to buy me a truck. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> you know, she knew a few years ago I gave up my truck because, you know, we couldn't afford it. So I gave it up and I bought a little thing to put me around town in, you know, and that's okay. That's fine. And so, but she's been praying that God, how much money does your truck cost? I keep telling her, I said, look, don't worry about it. I don't, you know. And so what happened was, you know, Becky decided to get me a truck. Actually, it wasn't Becky. It, was, it wasn't somebody else. Let me tell you a story. That way I won't be lying to you. There was a lady that loved her husband like my wife loves me. Loves her husband. 
he wanted a truck. Well, she didn't have a lot of money, but she decided to buy him this truck. And she bought a truck. I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, it just, man, looking at it, you just go, wow. You know, and then you get inside, and the dashboard had everything imaginable up there. Computer, I mean, TV screen, had all the gadgets, had everything in there. Just unbelievable. But the only thing it didn't have in it was, a, was an engine. <laughs> so he looked really good sitting in it, you know. He could push all the buttons. It had a battery in it, so he could watch TV on the screen. But there was no engine to make it go. If we're going to be the witness that we need to be for Jesus, then we better have that love of Christ, the engine that makes it go. Paul said his motivation, he says, the love of Christ constraineth me. It was his love for Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ did for him that moved him. Because Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know him. Look what it says in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death. Paul knew what that engine was. The engine, what? To know God. To know God to love God. Paul had a deep desire to win the loss to Christ, especially the Jewish people. Romans chapter 9, verse 2 and 3, he says that I have great heaviness, continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself was a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the faith. Paul said, I would rather cast my soul in hell, curse me, but save Israel, save my brethren. That's the passion that he had for the souls of other people and for the love of Christ that moved him. Paul's heart for the lost was based on the heart of God. What does it say in Peter? God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants us to come and turn from our sin and turn to him and trust him and believe the gospel and call upon him and be saved. See, if you and I are going to have fruit in our life, we need to have a real walk with God. We need to be before we do. We need to be before we do. We must give God our hearts before we give him our actions if we fail to have an ongoing relationship with the Lord, what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit of God, we're going to become insensitive to that Holy Spirit, to his leading, to his nudging. When he nudges us to witness to somebody and we keep our mouth shut. When he witnesses and nudges us to give a track out and we withhold it, it's because that relationship is not there. We need an ongoing relationship with the Lord or our witness is going to fall away. Our boldness is going to turn into the fear of man, and it's going to bring a snare into our very, very lives. So listen, our fruit bearing is directly related to our relationship with Jesus Christ, to our relationship with him. Do we have a sincere, true walk with God? We must what? We must follow him first. Look what it says in Matthew 4, 19. Jesus said, follow me, and then what? I will make you fishers of men. He said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. Question is, are we following him or are we following the world? Are we following our flesh or are we following him? Notice Mark 3, 14. And he ordained 12 that they should be what? With him. He said, I want you to be with me. And that he might send them forth to preach. We got to be with him before we go. We need to understand that. Both aspects are important. Following is important. Fishing is important. Okay? 
Time with him is important. Telling other people about him is important. The order of both of them is important. Follow him, he'll make you fishers of men. Follow him, he'll show you what to say. He'll show you how to say it. The order is very, very important. Simply put, and this was very convicting to my soul, our walk with God or our lack of our walk with God is going to have an effect on our witness, whether or not we are really going to witness or not. So let's check our temperature. Let's check our temperature because motives do matter. Let's look at the thermometer of our love because if we do not witness, it's probably an indication that my love for Jesus Christ is not where it should be. Turn to the book of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. That chapter in my Bible is so, I've got so many notes and so much markings, I can hardly read even the scripture because of how messy I write. <laughs> but in John 14, look at verse 15. If you love me, what does he say? Keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll be obedient to what I've told you to do. Remember what he told the church to do before he left this earth, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Go, if you love me, keep my commandments. Notice what he says in verse number 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Woo! I'm going to manifest my, I'm going to show you just who I am and how great I am. And look at verse number 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. and My Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Verse 24, oh, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Oh, oh. You see, if we don't witness, it's an indication that our love has fallen aside. Like that Ephesus church when they said, I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. You've left your first love. You've left me. See, we do what we do to show him that we love him. He did what he did to show us, to demonstrate to us how much he loved us. He went to the cross and did that for you and did that for me. The greatest motivation is the constraining motivation found in 2 Corinthians 5.14. As Paul said, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So I have some questions for you this morning. How is our walk with God? Right now, be honest, search your heart, examine yourselves, the Bible says. How's your walk with God? Is it so special that you're following him that are you fishing? Are you fishing? Do you have an engine? Is it working? Do you look really good on the outside? You've got all the little things, man. You've got your, you got your computers. You've got your, I can find this in Strong Memorial. It's amazing, the touch of your hand. I can find all this knowledge, and there's knowledge, and there's knowledge, and there's knowledge, and there's knowledge. And wow, I know I go to this small group, and I go here, and I'm, I'm being discipled, and I, I've got this, and I've got this, and I, I got no, Bible says knowledge puffeth up. We get so full of ourselves. We've got to give it out. <laughs> We've got to give it out. We got a witness. We're going to have to tell other people about him. How's your walk with God? Do you spend time in his word regularly? Do you have a prayer life for the last several months? Our church, many different people, different classes have been teaching on prayer. Do we have that relational prayer life? Has the love of Jesus Christ so gripped your heart that it moves you to witness for him? Does it move you to serve him? 
or you like one of those kids. You remember when you were young? I don't know if this ever happened to you, and, and, and you're being chosen on a team, and you're a little kid, and, oh, choose me, choose me. Here I am, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, when I would teach little kids how to play ball, I would, I'd have a summer camp, and I'd teach them, everyone will play right field, everyone will play center field, everyone will play left field, third, everyone's going to play every position. Well, coach, I, I'm a first baseman. I said, you're going to learn to play second. Well, I'm a lefty. I don't care. You're going to learn to play second. Well, well, why? I said, one day, one of your coaches is going to come up to you and say, have you ever played this position? And if you say no, you know what the coach is going to do? He's going to go to the next kid. Say, have you ever played that? Yeah, okay, go get in the game. And you're still sitting on the bench. Here am I, Lord. Paul had that Damascus situation where Jesus Christ showed up. Who are you, Lord? Oh, Jesus. Oh, what would thou have me to do? I'm available. Are we a servant of the Most High? And I got online a couple days ago, and I found something that just really gripped me about the Christians that are around the world right now that we really don't really know. If you don't follow what's going on, I, I, I subscribe to a magazine called Fox's Book of Martyrs, or excuse me, yeah, or the Martyrs or whatever, not Fox's Book of Martyrs, but there's a magazine about martyrs. I can't think of the title right now, but anyway, I get it in my office. And so it talks about our brothers and sisters around the world that are suffering. They're suffering because they're telling people about Jesus, okay? They're sharing their faith. The Christians in Iran, they say, if we evangelize, they're going to put us in prison. I have met some of those men. I personally met them in private Bible studies when I went to Kathmandu, and they told me about being in prison for seven years because they became a Christian and wanted to tell their family about Jesus. And they had them arrested and put in prison for seven years. But they kept telling people anyway, even in prison. Christians in India, if we evangelize, the crowd is going to beat us to death. But guess what? We're going to do it anyway. I'm a good friend with the Nelms people, the Nelms brothers who have that final frontiers and the, the, the Maitili and the, you know, up in India and all the souls that were saved, but they also send a report of the churches that are burned and the Christians that are killed and the pastors that are tortured because of their faith. You say, that's, what the, that's what's going to happen to them, but they what? They do it anyway. And the Christians in China, this is sad, but he says, if we evangelize, they're going to take our body parts. <laughs> They're going to use them for transplants, but we're going to preach anyway. And then we have America. If we evangelize, evangelize here, oh, I feel funny. I feel awkward. I'm afraid somebody's going to say no. I'm afraid somebody's going to laugh at me. So I'm not going to do it. Why are we that way? Wow. Come on, we have the greatest news we serve the king of kings and the lord of lords the creator of the universe we serve him we serve a living savior he lives in me and he lives in you if you're born again so we need to be about the father's business let's pray father lord we come in the name of jesus this morning God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving my soul. Lord, I know I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner saved by your grace. I know I make mistakes so much. Lord, Romans 7 says, the things I know to do and yet I don't do, I, and uh, the things I do, and I, I, it's just this flesh, there's such a battle with this carnality because this body has not been redeemed yet yes my soul has been cut away thank you thank you for the power of god thank you for your word thank you for prayer thank you for the church thank you for my brothers and sisters here today lord lord you've given us a command follow me and i will make you fishers of men the heads are bowed eyes closed no one looking around ask a question. You're here today, you say, Brother Bobby, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure. 
If I were to die right now where I spend eternity, Brother Bobby, would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Slip it up real high. I want to pray for you. I will not call you out. I promise you. I will not come to where you're sitting. I'm not that type of person. I will not do that to you. I won't embarrass you whatsoever. I just want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand and say, Bobby, pray for me. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. I don't know if I'd go to heaven if I were to die. Anyone like that? Anyone like that? Okay. I guess I'm preaching to the choir. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Say, Brother Bobby, I'm not the witness I should be. And Lord, I... (laughs) Lord, I'm not either. I need to be so sensitive when I'm out and have that heart for you. Well, how many would say, Brother Bobby, pray for me. I need a heart for God to know him even more so I can be the witness that I need to be. Would you just raise your hand? Bobby, pray for me. God bless you. Father, thank you. Father, you've seen the hands, so many, so many of us. Lord, we need you and your power. Lord, thank you again for your mercy, your long-suffering, your gentleness to us. Help us never forget what you've done for us. Lord, just stamp it in our hearts and our minds, Father. Give us that boldness we need to witness. Let us be sensitive to the Spirit of God. Lord, use us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. As the music is played, if you raise your hand and said, I prayed for you.